it, it's uh, it works out just great if I uh, uh, if I sleep in, you know. Whereas by nature, you know, if I don't pull the blinds, come thing, but I'm one of those guys that likes to get up early, you know. And of course, that don't go with uh, uh, 2 a.m. finishes uh, yeah. in the village, you know, and stuff like that. But I. I seem to have knocked it pretty good. I've just woken up almost, you know. Yeah, which is, uh, uh, you play better if you have a little sleep, you know. <laughs> you can do anything better if you have a little sleep. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Seems to be a necessary regeneration process. <laughs> okay. So how'd you like to start? Uh, well, I'm going to ask you some questions. What? Can I ask you some questions? Yeah, oh, sure, yeah. Seventy years old, is it like a pedestal where you look down or look around and see things differently? No, I don't think so because it all just comes gradually to you, you know. And uh, I look at my brother who just quit playing uh, uh, hockey. Uh, who uh, uh, He was the original band leader and then he went on to be a, a, an NYU professor of psychology, you know. And uh, so he gave up music, now he's back in music, and uh, of course I don't see him very often, and he's a year and a half older than me, you know, and um, uh, I don't see much of a change, he's still very active, and we joke about the fact he finally gave up playing, uh, playing ice hockey, which was probably a good idea at 71. <laughs> and uh, with me, uh, uh, so far I just feel uh, good and enjoy the music, and I enjoy the whole uh, uh, thing that I do, perhaps even more now, because I've got all the young influences that are great players on the band. And uh, <clears throat> so somewhere in there it all works better, you know. And uh, uh, if you remember all those bad movies they did on big bands, you know, and uh, all that, uh, um, it's a little better than that. We've only pushed the bus once in the last eight years, you know. <laughs> But Hollywood's version of the big band days was quite dramatic, as you probably know. Yeah. Cool. So the the Glenn Miller story and and the Hollywood movies that portrayed the lifestyle of big band musicians was not accurate. You kind of got in at the end of that. Yeah. How was it different? Uh no, it's just different uh, in a sense that when you're talking about films and things like that, the people that create uh, films, for instance. Uh, Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? And it's boo-wah, boo-wah. Instead of that, it's boo-wah, boo-wah. But nothing about the music was really that uh, much paid attention to in terms of uh, uh, the way filmmakers do it today, uh, where they tend to make uh, uh, pay more attention uh, to artistic uh, detail, uh, you know, and all that. It was very romantic, and I'm sure uh, if you were a Glenn Miller uh, uh, freak, uh, you loved it, you know. Well, you spend a good percentage of the year traveling around in a bus. Oh, yeah. What sure. percentage of the year do you spend? I'd say about eight and a half months out of the year. And back when you first got into the business, when you were traveling around with Kenton and stuff like that, mm -hmm. what percentage of the year did you spend? <laughs> Maybe 12 months, I'm not sure. How has it changed? Now, well, you're no longer, uh, for instance, say to a musician, uh, we're starting on uh, March the 25th, and we'll be out there for seven weeks. You just say, uh, you got the gig, and that's it. And, you, you, and uh, if you were a, quote, side man in those days, all you did was just say, uh, wow, I got the gig. And, and you're very happy, and it never occurs to you that uh, uh, the tour is going to end. Woody Herman never, ever, I don't think, uh, have, I mean, I know positively uh, when he hired guys of business like, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, we'll take a few weeks off in, uh, uh, I don't know if he took Christmas off, you know. And, uh, well, he had to pay his taxes. Uh, what's that? He had to pay his taxes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of guys got in trouble like that, you know. But he wasn't his fault. Um, oh, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Do you, in terms of uh, young musicians traveling around on a, on a bus playing with a band, really valuable, invaluable learning experience, right? Uh, Good way to develop as a musician? Oh, oh yeah, and, um, and not only that, uh, nowadays we have to remember uh, the difference is that uh, um, uh, just as uh, 
uh, young girl tennis players now uh, threaten or even win uh, like U.S. Opens and things like that uh, because of the uh, educational advantages of uh, uh, International Association of Jazz Educators. I love the fact they had to change their logo about five years ago. It was the N-A-J-E, now it has to be the I-A. I love that, you know. And we see it when I'm suddenly doing clinics with interpreters. Uh, uh, number one, I think uh, it's unfortunate we call them clinics, uh, and yet I know that master class sounds pompous and all that. The clinic sounds like there's something wrong with the kids, you know. <laughs> you better go to the clinic and get that taken care of, that B flat minor seventh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but nonetheless, uh, 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 music and jazz education have really come through a lot of. Uh, um, great um, uh, cutbacks and uh, uh, resentment because the school band can't get a new piano, but there's lots of foot, uh, football helmets available, you know, and things of that nature. So uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of music education in the schools, and uh, uh, I remember once in an outburst where they uh, asked me to say something after I won some award, and. Uh, uh, and I had just come from my hotel room, such as we're in right here, and watched violence on the street in L.A. and all that kind of stuff, you know. And if you ever get on a band bus with uh, the kids that are on the, uh, uh, the marching band and they're going to a football, and, uh, and it's uh, just the kind of fun that you want your kids to have, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, th nobody has the same joy I say, hey, wow, today, algebra, never happens, you know, <laughs> but, but, but today is band practice day, today is, uh, uh, you know, uh, and so, so uh, it's a fun thing. Maybe we can substitute uh, handguns for alto saxophones, I don't know, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I happen to like that, you know, because uh, um, uh, I've even received letters from uh, people that uh, almost never played again after they got out of school, and yet that was one of their major uh, memories of their school years, you know. And I think uh, the, that music education in the schools is really hip. You know? Do you think that the caliber of musicians that uh, enter your band today, as, as opposed to the caliber of musicians who entered the big bands in the 50s, is different in any way because of the music education? Oh, absolutely. Because it was a whole other way of learning how to play back then. Yeah, because you'll notice that um, um, uh, I was very fortunate in my career, but uh, 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 before uh, we had all this um, music and jazz education, uh, uh, what we had often was the, uh, you almost can't find a great improviser anymore who's young who isn't also a fine sight reader. Uh, you know, whereas we used to have that. Jimmy Ford, my lead alto player, boy, terrorist, uh, a player. And, and uh, Willie Maiden would teach him note by note his lead alto part because, like, he just never uh, had also that formal education, uh, which uh, people used to even try and uh, uh, guys that couldn't read would say, well, uh, it, you remain more natural. That's all jive, man. You know, now uh, what it really gets into is having uh, 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 that you can have both. You know, uh, we see examples going from Wynton Marcellus, and uh, uh, I mean, by that the classical and the jazz thing to uh, to whatever. You know, and um, uh, now we see it where uh, 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 the musician that comes on my band is maturing. Uh, at a much earlier age, just like I mentioned, the tennis players and the and it's a uh, why them because of their coaching, and in this case, uh, uh, the music educators, uh, IAJE, uh, uh, Bill Lee, and all those uh, people that put that thing together, uh, uh, the whole bunch of them, and I think that's uh, one great thing that we did. And when the budget cuts came, <clears throat> we noticed that my band would be hired in a junior high school, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, they would make money uh, off um, <clears throat> because of the enthusiasm of the parents. Uh, you know, they can't go out and buy uh, uh, TV uh, 
uh, time slots and stuff like that but for a junior high school that's bringing in Maynard Ferguson to play for a night. But by doing what they uh, do, the parents, uh, we, we always laugh and say, I have the best fed uh, band uh, in the business now, you know, because uh, the, the parents are involved. God forbid the little girl that plays third clarinet in the marching band, you know, if, if her daddy owns the Cadillac agency, uh, you know, there'll be posters, there'll be, you know, and we don't even see any of that usually, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we just come into town like a traveling band, check into a hotel, and, uh, and uh, uh, do our gig, and sometimes even hit and run it. And, uh, uh, but for the uh, uh, upmanship has come is in the traveling, you know, we, uh, the buses now, uh, I don't know how we did it in the old days. We just sat on a Greyhound type bus uh, upright. So did Count Basie, so did uh, uh, Stan Kenton, so did Duke Ellington, uh, Woody Herman. Now, uh, all of them sat right, uh, you know, in, no, it was the rock and roll kids that really got us, uh, uh, taught us a lesson, and it's called Throw Out the Seats. And, uh, you know, and we now have uh, all the glamorous bunks and uh, and the the cooking uh, things and the uh, uh, and the sound, great sound, uh, uh, and the bus. Uh, I I probably admire more trumpet players uh, whose names I'm confused with of the young from guys in my band saying, uh, "Hey, boss, check this guy out," and they put a set of earphones in my head for 20 minutes. You know, and uh, so. Uh, uh, a lot of it is up level, and then of course the, uh, and therefore the traveling is not as uh, bizarre as it was in the old days. Right. I mean that's what I meant at the beginning of right. our interview, well, yeah. pushing the old beat up bus yeah. and uh, uh, all that. So it's a, uh, it's a much easier and better life now. Yeah. And you mentioned trumpet players. Let me name some trumpet players off the top of your head. Whatever comment comes to your mind. All right, but there'd have to be four that uh, uh, maybe it's because I'm 70 uh, that I, I probably won't pop out. But certainly, uh, if we're talking, uh, who influenced me? Actually, what I wanted to do, uh, Maynard, was give you the names of some trumpet players and then just get your comments on them. Oh sure. Yeah. Miles Davis. Oh, Miles Davis, one of the most creative uh, forces uh, uh, in music. Uh, some people that were, say, classical trumpet players. Uh, would hear him uh, crack a note, miss a note, uh, and uh, uh, and would base their opinion without uh, thinking about all the creative things. Uh, as far as the mechanics of the instrument uh, goes, he, he was not a Bud Herseth of the uh, uh, principal trumpet for the uh, Chicago Symphony, and, and I don't think he wanted to be that. Uh, we must remember that, just like when they talk about me and the, and the double high C's, some of my all-time favorite heroes of the instrument uh, never played a double high C in their lives, you know. They might have thought about it a couple of times, and that was it, you know. So uh, uh, I think we all, uh, all the great players, I remember I, I used to spend time with Dizzy, and, uh, and we'd laugh about doing our own things and still admiring the, uh, uh, the other thing. You know, it's, it's usually writers and magazines that uh, put it into a competi uh, competitive thing. You know, uh, uh, when I hear Winton play particularly, well, let me see now, what do I like? But Beautiful, I love that. And uh, um, at the same time, uh, uh, we can go through all, but with Miles, you know, because at Birdland, well, we were usually uh, on the same bill. They always had two attractions, so it would be uh, Maynard Ferguson and his Birdland Dream Band in those days, and on the other side would be Miles Davis, you know, with Coltrane and Cannonball and Philly Joe Jones and Paul Chambers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and which is Miles. So intermissions, my band usually did not go to upstairs to the bar. Uh, it, uh, not, well, I, it was really fun to be on the same bill. If it was somebody that you didn't care that much for, um, uh, half the band would be at the bar upstairs, you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Miles was a uh, was great to play with and uh, uh, was a great uh, friend of mine in spite of all the stories uh, you hear when, and when they found out when he found out once, oh yeah, I love this. When he found out once that I was uh, about one eighth 
Cognawagan Indian, that's a Canadian small tribe. But I, uh, he said, I knew you weren't all white. There was, that, I knew there was some reason I just love you. You know, <laughs> and that's Miles Davis, man. You know, and uh, uh, I could tell you Miles Davis, because, you know, we, like when you do five sets a night, you know, even though they're on while you're off and all that, eventually you really uh, get to know each other, you know. And uh, 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 one of the stories that was wild uh, that I can tell uh, is uh, one about uh, a very nicely dressed man uh, in the table section of Birdland, of course, you know, with his son, who was almost dressed uh, identically with the shirt, the tie, the whole thing. And uh, Miles was waiting, you know, with no wasted time with Pee Wee Marquette at Birdland, you know, uh, when one band stopped, the other one had five minutes and they hit, you know. And uh, even if there was four guys missing, uh, you know, <clears throat> on my band, I was pretty lucky about that. But uh, any, anyway, this guy, so Miles and I were sort of standing together. He had just come off, and I was waiting to go on. It was just that five minutes, and this man rushes up with his 11-year-old son and says, Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, I've uh, always been a fan of yours. I have all your records. And, uh, uh, and, and Miles was nice, and he said, oh, thank you. Uh, you know, he said, would you say hello to my son? You know, and, uh, and, and, and Miles was just as gracious as could be, and he held out his hand, and, uh, and the kid sort of whacked his hand. It was kind of cocky, you know, and, and grabbed his hand, like, you know, and uh, said, uh, said, yeah, wild, Miles. Hey, you know something? You never played better. And Miles looked at him and said, hey, kid, how the hell would you know? <laughs> and that is Miles Davis. And while I was like aghast, you know, because you saw the father's face drop, the, uh, uh, the kid looked look funny, and then Miles walked right away, but he grabbed me by the arm. Uh, and r right n near there's the waiter's door and where the band room is, uh, and, he grabbed me, and he was hysterical in laughter. He never thought of it in terms of any sort of negative output. It was just to him really having fun, see? Uh, but uh, of course other people interpreted that sometimes in a different way because it, it was pretty loud, you know, and those tables and people are real close to you, you know, yeah. in a small jazz club, yeah. you know. Um, Clifford Brown and Clark Terry, that infamous session you did with them. Any memories of that? Oh, I have so many, it's unbelievable, you know. Uh, first of all, uh, once again, uh, two more of my superheroes, by the way. Uh, uh, if we were dealing in uh, uh, the old game called Careers, I would say the fame cards came awfully late for Clark Terry. Because um, uh, I always thought of him as one of the great uh, in spite of my chops and what people say about my chops, I always uh, said, well, I think the perfect officer is really Clark Terry's, and it's a natural one. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't have a callus like a working man's hand like I do, and things of that nature. And uh, uh, so uh, very, uh, when I'm doing my teaching and my master class things, uh, I'm right in there about uh, Clark a lot in terms of who to emulate. Do you remember when he used to go from flugelhorn to uh, trumpet? And it made no difference to him. Uh, uh, my brain always clicked, even though I used to go French horn, uh, baritone horn, uh, trombone, uh, trumpet, you know. And the uh, funny thing is, it was only in recent years I uh, added the flugelhorn, which is normally the first instrument a trumpet player uh, uh, starts to double on, you know. But I was into uh, uh, the saxophone, because my brother was a fine uh, saxophonist, and we used to play duets together when we were kids. So uh, I still play the soprano when I'm doing any of the uh, Indian orientated things. But uh, uh, Clifford Brown, I considered one of the most, both of those guys were lyrical. That's what I loved about their playing. And, uh, and both were very creative, and you could. S what I love about jazz music is because I've said all the same nice things, the same nice things, but both of those guys, they don't sound uh, alike at all uh, to me, uh, you know. And uh, Sri Satya Sai Baba once said, 
it is better to not bother blessing the instrument that you've invented. Uh, uh, better to uh, 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 better to bless the, uh, the player, you know. So even though their musical thoughts, I think, were very much the same, uh, and yet uh, uh, you didn't listen to Clifford and say, "Oh, there's Cl Clark's got a new album out," you know. Even though I never was that great at those uh, Leonard Feather blindfold tests, you know. Um, eventually, I'd get corralled and have to do one. <laughs> Can we change directions there a little bit? Talk about spirituality. Uh huh. Uh, Coltrane infused a certain spirituality to his music. I mean, and, and mm -hmm. acknowledged that not really too many musicians today are out front about that aspect of their lives. Mm -hmm. I know that you've undergone, undertaken, once a year you go to India. I get, imagine you yeah. spend time in an ashram. How has that developed as an important part of your life, and how do you think your music reflects it? Well, I tell you what, the spiritual thing to me uh, uh, is just a, just a part of me, and, uh, and when I go there, I become uh, like a local high school band director, because, uh, uh, but not for the first 10 years. I would go uh, with my wife, and we'd stay for about, uh, oh, I'd say, uh, six to eight weeks uh, are there, and uh, it's a beautiful ashram, and uh, very spiritual, and uh, two darshans, as we say, a day that's, uh, darshan means uh, uh, merely in the presence of a holy man, you know. And uh, w uh, one of the oddities of, uh, that I love are two things. First of all, he says, do not evangelize. So uh, uh, on my, uh, uh, on my time here with this camera, uh, you know, you won't catch me saying, you really ought to check it out, you know. <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, or what he says, if you come to me, and I love this, if you come to me, he says, come to me and, and leave better at what you already are. Uh, you know, in other words, don't make him uh, I won't be a Catholic anymore. I'll be a Sai Baba devotee. <laughs> that, that's not uh, the uh, what, What's his name again, please? Sai Baba. Uh, yeah, or uh, Sri Satya Sai Baba is how he's usually uh -huh. referred to. And uh, he has the finest school system in uh, all of India. And uh, uh, India, you'll find the uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, Indian chiefs, uh, we get their education either in England or the United States very often, you know, um, with the exception of this place, uh, which where you can go there all the way through universities. And that's why uh, after a few years of going there, uh, uh, for like I say, a month and a half, um, he suddenly came to me uh, in his orange robe and everything, you know, and it's not one of those, you know, uh, uh, hand me your, all your credit cards and your checkbook and I'll show you God. <laughs> None of that's going on, you know. As a matter of fact, it's very hard to donate there. Uh, you have to, uh, he has to, uh, and his people have to know where you're coming from and uh, uh, well, whether you want to donate to the poor or in my case to the music educational system, which uh, 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 he came to me suddenly with all these holy men, and I'm sitting up amongst them, you know, and I was raised with no religion at all. And uh, he, uh, uh, he suddenly walked over to me, and, uh, and I'd already played for him, and he materialized this necklace and rings and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, and, then, and then I was, he would say, do not ta attach too much importance uh, uh, to uh, materializing uh, things because uh, 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 they should be only reminders of your, of your true self and your spiritual self, you know. And uh, I didn't mean to turn this into uh, <laughs> as some sort of a, uh, uh, yeah, we'll take this film and, uh, and um, let's put it on TV and I'll become an... Uh, no, but I'm curious, <laughs> I mean, personally, I, I'm curious yeah. about this because I know like in the 60s, you were at Millbrook, you were much, you must have like been on some kind of searching path, spiritually, whatever. Oh, always, always. How did you get into this particular cat, Sai Baba? Well, I, I got into it through being interested in Indian music. And, uh, and from the music and the, uh, 
uh, tremendous uh, thing that happened with uh, Ravi Shankar, and I guess uh, um, it was more him than his association with the Beatles or, or uh, any of that, but I'm sure that was also at least peaked uh, something. But the music was really where it was at at the beginning, and then uh, having a friend, uh, Vimu Mukunda, who's a, in India a famous uh, Veena player. Veena is the original instrument of Ravi Shankar. It's slightly similar to a sitar, and it's called the mother instrument of India, actually. And uh, uh, so uh, when I lived in England, uh, I would sit with the Indian musicians and, uh, and play with them. And when I played for Sai Baba in India, I can assure you I didn't have any smoking uh, blues rhythm section. I had a tabla players, I had Murdungam players, uh, tambouri, veena, all, all the Indian instruments, you know. And so I would play with them. So uh, 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 at times I would be the teacher, and then uh, uh, a lot of times I'd be the student, you know. And when they get into it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, and all these kind of uh, rhythms and stuff, that's where we become the amateurs, you know. Unless you studied with Hank Levy or uh, uh, any one of the guys that has uh, devoted a tremendous amount of their career to the time signatures, or as the Indians say, the talas, you know. But uh, anyway, so with all that, uh, um, suddenly he said, you ought to... Uh, Vima Mukunda, uh, I used him on uh, two of my albums in the old days, and, uh, um, and, and he kept talking about Sai Baba because he was from Bangalore, India, which is the nearest big city uh, to Puta Party, where this gorgeous school and the grounds and everything are uh, really something. And uh, uh, so eventually I took my wife and uh, all five children, and uh, and that's quite a, a thing to, uh, to do. And uh, and we were uh, landed in Bombay whew, with more useless luggage, you know, and things, which is what you do when you're your first time you go to India, you know, because you don't know what you're going to need, so you bring you bring your house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we laughed about that, but uh, a lot of happy uh, porters are uh, getting. Uh, American-style tipping, so everybody was quite happy, yeah. Very, very happy, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, so that so that was the, uh, but it started with the Ravi Shankar thing, and then uh, my wife's a great uh, reader of spiritual books, and that passes on to me, of course, too, you know. And uh, so if you go on my bus, you'll see uh, a puja table, uh, like uh, instead of having it here, I have it in the bedroom in there, and I, that's puja uh, means like a prayer table, if you will, you know. And still to this day, every time I I go on stage, uh, they empty my dressing room for just a minute, and, and I do a very short uh, thing, just reminding myself that uh, uh, that I'm making myself happy by doing this, and uh, and. Uh, I wish to make my musicians that play with me happy. And then what I feel is important, I'm not sure Miles agreed with me, <laughs> but, but I find it very important to, trans, uh, to transfer that happiness uh, in an honest way to the audience, you know. And um, so uh, uh, I'm not a fan of the amen. I play for myself and that's it. I think that sounds very hip. In script. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your music has always had a very powerful energy to it. As you go around today, a lot of young people mm -hmm. who might not even be into jazz because difficult to find in the media mm -hmm. are very attracted to you and your music. Mm -hmm. What is the dynamic of it do you, that you think draws people into it? Well, I tell you what, the fact uh, is that uh, uh, we won't name names but in this case, uh, but. Uh, uh, I have a very happy band. Well, we have a lot of fun, you know. And uh, uh, Linda Mertz happens to be our business manager, uh, and uh, um, not the booking agent or the management, uh, tour management, but uh, the business management. And uh, suddenly she was in New York just the other night, and half the guys, uh, she was a voice on the phones. She makes up the payroll checks uh, on, and all that in Ventura, California. And we were so delighted that she wanted to come to New York. 
and she had such a wonderful time uh, with all the guys in the band. And of course it was wild because right opposite the Blue Note, uh, there's a place uh, uh, the guys like to hang, uh, the kettle of fish, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and suddenly she was surrounded by, by 10 or 11 guys, all the guys in the band, of course, you know. And uh, because they were so surprised to see her, you know. And so, it, and uh, the point being that she had the time of her life, she, and, uh, uh, you know, we're laughing and saying it'll be hard to keep her in Ventura, California now, you know. And um, she's got two uh, teenage sons, and, uh, well, but she saw that, uh, the band was having uh, fun. I know that uh, uh, real great geniuses like, uh, uh, say, Buddy Rich, uh, ruled his band in a different way than I do. You know, and uh, 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 ruled—that's an interesting way to describe it. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, and we all know all the jokes and all the tapes and all that. But uh, um, sometimes, uh, oh yeah, Tom Garling who I produce on Concord Records uh, as a producer, and his first album is out, and he's still with the band, though, you know. And uh, he was with Buddy Rich, so he can do all the imitations we need. <laughs> but we used to say uh, uh, a musician that came off that band, and mind you, that was a wonderful band, uh, but, but he just had the old, was it Toscanini that used to rant and rave at the, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a different, and, and again, everybody loved uh, uh, Bernstein. When I did my solo things with him, uh, it was wonderful, you know, and uh, and pleasant. And uh, uh, when he made a correction, it always sounded like <laughs> uh, like a suggestion, you know. It was really a correction, you understand, but uh, just that nice artistic diplomacy, uh, which I think uh, makes, uh, I tell you what, uh, the regimental part of music, playing together, uh, can be affected by the other way uh, uh, positively. But the individual artistry, I think it's a negative if you have a feeling uh, around you of uh, aggression, whatever it is, you know. And uh, I like to give the guys the freedom to the point that uh, uh, with their writing and their playing, uh, that uh, when you come to a rehearsal, uh, if you dyed my hair black, you wouldn't know who the leader was, you know. And that's mm. the way I think it should be, Yeah, you know. Two final things. Um, first of all, uh, you travel around a lot. I don't know if you've spent any time on the Internet, but there are a number of Maynard Ferguson sites on yeah. the Internet. It's funny. Your, your timing is perfect. Last night, the first show last night, uh, it, it went all over the world, and there was, like, right. tech things and... Uh, uh, apparently, uh, you can't download, uh, uh, and it, it came from the Blue Note, uh, the whole set, and people who watched said it was fading in and out, and, and, but they just loved doing it. And you're right, there's Matt Keller, uh, and uh, these are the, uh, the few predominant ones that I know. Uh, Matt Keller in uh, Iowa, uh, and uh, uh, he was at the show the other night, <laughs> and the same thing with... Um, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know his phone. I, mean, I can't even hardly say. I know uh, anyway from Amsterdam, and uh, and uh, there's a whole bunch of so. I, so it's very uh, exciting, and I want to tell you one thing, boy. When it comes to high tech, you know, the guys in the band for my birthday gave me this watch, and I've got to find out how to set it. Uh, <laughs> and I'll probably give it to one of the guys that say set it for me, you know. And uh, anything musically electronic in the studio, I'm into. So I guess you can say I'm not very versatile when it comes to uh, uh, really understanding uh, websites and having it myself. I don't own a computer as yet. I now I've started to threaten uh, to own one. I don't have to have a thing. I love it. The guys are. The bus is loaded with them, you know. And maybe that's uh, wh why I get lazy. I just I can just ask them, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, but um, but whereas part of me would like to get into it, that's a time-consuming game. Very. Yeah. Very. Do you think you're going to be able to maintain this pace? I mean, how long do you plan on going on like this? It's not easy being on the road. And the trumpet is a cruel taskmaster. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, that's right. But uh, at the same time, uh, 
uh, it's almost like as long as I enjoy it, which I know that will be forever, only as long as my health and everything feels good. And I'm, uh, I'm looking for something wood. <laughs> uh, so far, I've enjoyed very good health. You know? And uh, uh, I think that that's probably uh, about the only way to answer it. It just seems like this is what I was meant to do. I love presenting all these young, great players. And, uh, and, and I always say, uh, if you're going to leave my band, I'll only be mad at you if you're not a big success of what you're going to do next, you know. And because uh, all the uh, Don Ellis's, Peter Erskine's, uh, Wayne Shorter's, uh, um, uh, on, I don't know, I'm leaving out a million, uh, uh, not a million, but uh, uh, at, at least a couple of hundred guys have gone on to be very successful at whatever they want to do after Maynard, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, to wrap this up for the magazine, yeah. um, what type of trumpet do you play? What type of mouthpiece? That. Okay. Uh, I, I play the MF horn, which is made for me by Holton, uh, uh, Holton slash LeBlanc uh, Corporation in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I've been into designing uh, uh, trumpets. I've never understood piano players, for instance, that can tune a piano. I find that amazing. Uh, I mean, that would be one of the first things I would, if the piano was my instrument, you know. and. Um, so I became involved in designing when I was living in England those eight years with the Bridge Band Corporation. And uh, from there then, when I came back to live in the United States, I was immediately uh, uh, approached by, uh, uh, by the people at Houghton, uh, the Pascucci family, and, uh, uh, and I worked with Larry Ramirez. I, in other words, I didn't just uh, give a name. Uh, you know, you can do it like a golf player does it, uh, uh, you know. Maynard Ferguson plays that model. Instead of that, we had, I was playing on the stand with three liter pipes all taped together and uh, uh, th until I got what I really wanted, you know. So I've been designing instruments uh, for Holton and uh, uh, they're called the MF Horn and then I also, uh, went along with Larry Ramirez, because he's a, you don't put me behind the lathe, man. I'd, might lose my fingers <laughs> in the first, no, uh, but uh, a lot of trial and error uh, things. The, uh, the Firebird is a, uh, a slide trumpet and a, uh, um, uh, and a valve trumpet at the same time, and the Super Bone is uh, uh, both a uh, slide trombone and a valve trombone uh, at the same time, you know, and uh, things like that. And then I have two bores, uh, meaning uh, depending on how much you want to fill a horn and the type of player that you are, uh, whether you want to put that much of an air stream through a horn, uh, and uh, all that. Uh, that's why the uh, um, was really a, uh, a medium bore and uh, and a very large bore, which is the one I use mostly. Uh, and anyway, they're called the MF horns. The trumpets are. And uh, then my mouthpiece is by Dave Manette, and he's the guy who makes all those marvelous uh, trumpets for uh, uh, Whitten Marcellus and all, all, a whole bunch of the guys and uh, a lot of the uh, symphony principal uh, trumpet players, and all the, I shouldn't say just the principal trumpet players, but uh, 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 he's just a marvelous uh, horn maker also, you know. And um, uh, he and I are great friends. We eat Indian food together, and he makes my mouthpieces. And um, uh, so... Uh, Any electrical hookups or anything you use? Uh, I have in the past. When I had the high voltage band, which was, uh, you know, the uh, uh, one other horn player and, and a monster rhythm section, you know. And uh, that was called high voltage, and I did that for two years. And it was all involved in the computerized electronics that are so much a part of today's music. And uh, um, <coughs> from that, uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, but the, by the, somewhere around the second year, I started to get bored with it. But I remember once turning around uh, uh, from the audience and I started to conduct, and I realized I was conducting uh, uh, Dennis de Blasio. And uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. That, nothing sillier than a uh, a two horn band and uh, and a guy out there conducting. You know. Uh, uh, so we uh, 
I think that was the key to, you know, this isn't really my niche. But out of that, I became a better producer. I also produced Christian Jacobs' uh, uh, first album, you know, and I was fun with uh, 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 Petitucci and uh, Peter Erskine, uh, whom I got, uh, you know, that's like alumni, you know. And um, uh, so I enjoyed putting them together uh, with, because uh, uh, I think of, uh, uh, I, I just think of him as a genius piano player, you know. Yeah. And, uh, uh, he happens to be married to my youngest daughter, and uh, uh, she, yeah, she was a pupil of his when he first came from France. You see, uh, Christian uh, uh, came as a teacher at the uh, Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and, uh, and my daughter uh, was there uh, studying music, you know, and that's how they met and got married. So, uh, uh, but uh, even if my daughter had, <laughs> even without that, it was a uh, a privilege to produce that album. Uh, I was talking with Bruce Lundeval the other day about it, and he said, what a great job I've done as a producer. And I said, guess what my best talent is as a producer? And it's the only time I keep my mouth shut. Uh, you know, but that depends on the extreme talent. And, and then you, uh, you open it when you really have to open it, you know. But uh, I think when you've got tremendously creative people in the studio, it's not necessary to feel like the captain on the bridge. Yeah. yeah. One final thing. Also with the feature in Jazz Times, they run a little box that says listening pleasures. Could you recommend three CDs? They could be yours or they could be others. Wow. Wow. That, that one's really hard. I can uh, imagine so. Uh, well, let's take one of yours. What? Uh, for mine? Yeah, let's, let's try one um, of yours. From any period. Oh, if we go back to the early days, I think I have a fondness for uh, uh, the message from Newport, uh, with "Frame for the Blues," slight Hampton's com uh, composition, and it's playing. and And um, uh, I consider him a great genius. Uh, he owes me a chart. That's right. And uh, <laughs> and um, he's even got a new version, you know, out of. Uh, Right for the blues, yeah. it's terrific, you know. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And, what uh, about music outside of jazz? Anything classical, Indian, any oh, other? Oh, well, Indian, then we get into all those guys whose names I keep forgetting how to pronounce, but, uh, oh yeah, I listen to a lot of Indian music, and now Rana Swansky and I are uh, w working on a new suite, because, of course, we have the Sweet Baba Suite that I wrote while I was in India, and uh, that's a fusion, of course, of, uh, uh, of uh, jazz and... Uh, uh, classical Indian uh, music. That one's based on uh, uh, a traditional South Indian uh, raga uh, called Bai Rav. And, uh, and uh, uh, we loosely, uh, because we're jazz players, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we stay with the raga for a short while, then you catch us putting in all our blue notes and things that uh, uh, the ch uh, shock only uh, certain kinds of classical uh, Indian players, uh, but once they realize that it's a fusion, only it's a fusion of, uh, of jazz, and we did not go to the, it's easier to go to the rock with the even, even eighth notes, because that's often what they're playing rather than the jazz rhythm. Uh, but uh, Chip McNeil did a great uh, a job on the orchestration too, by the way, and um, uh, actually, uh, uh, I, I enjoy doing that, and, and it really does work because, of course, uh, the difference between our culture, uh, musically speaking, and theirs is that their classical musicians have to be great improvisers. Ours, they've even forgotten about improv because uh, uh, on the harpsichord, for instance, uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein was a great improviser. Uh, you know, and everybody would say, oh, really? Like, why does he want to do that, you know? And uh, because in a sense, you're, uh, you could say, uh, uh, us improvisers uh, are really uh, uh, like Bach. If we'd have had a Sony Walkman around then, there'd be 10,000 more Bach etudes, uh, you know, because he just sat down and played what came into his head, you know. and. Uh, 
So I think that it's a, it's a nice fusion is what I'm trying to say. And uh, the uh, Indian musicians seem to love it. When I played with my band, I took them to India and to Sai Baba's ashram, and we played uh, um, uh, our fusion thing, if you wish to call it that, you know, but based on their traditional ragas. The new one is called Shanmuga Priya. Gosh, I can't, can't wait for disc jockeys to do that one in. <laughs> and now here's Shanmuga Priya on rotation. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.